Good evening. Welcome to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. We still find Paul uh, dealing with the foolishness of the church and still having to kind of prove himself. You ask, why does Paul bother? I think he bothers because he loves them. He wants what is best for them. And honestly, they have a problem. They are listening to the lies of those taking advantage of them rather than the truth of the Lord from Paul. Paul understood that he was fighting for the future of the church in Corinth. Like we need to be fighting for the future of the church in this country. We too are in a battle. But we're going to start with uh, 11.3. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. So it's obvious here what's happening. There were some fast talking preachers. Once we learn later on, we're making demands for money, for food, for lodging, and the Corinthian people, they just bought into it. What's worse, they were preaching things that Paul did not and would not preach. He says they put up with preachers preaching a different Jesus with a different spirit and shared a different gospel, but again, they accepted it. Church, honestly, there are so many out there today also preaching a different gospel. They sound good, just like these, quote, apostles. How do we know who is preaching the truth and who isn't? Well, that's to me, is easy. See, my foundation of belief isn't established on, on just a preacher's message, but it's my daily reading of the word. I love Sundays, but it's kind of like the cherry on top of all of it. I respect my pastor, but I always still will compare um, his messages to the word of God. They weren't doing that. They just accepted and believed, even when it was contrary to the word of God. And even above Paul, yeah, the, the one who led him to the Lord and the one who personally met Jesus, and yet they were following these words of these people who were just there for money. Pretty crazy, isn't it? But I've also seen my share of Christians stop following the word, stop following pastors preaching the word, and I've seen them start following what I would call just popular preaching of the day. Verse 5 says, I, uh, I do not think I am in the least inferior to these quote, super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. Well, where do we start? Well, some honestly were thinking that these people were, quote, super apostles it kind of makes me laugh i'm sure they were entertaining they were funny they were deep they were powerful paul says i'm not a, that good of a speaker i'm untrained but he did have knowledge of the word of god please remember church it isn't about being entertained it is the pastor's biblical knowledge lining up with the word of god and in so we are becoming more like jesus so we kind of get to the point here. These entertainers, for that is what they were, were doing it, really, they were doing it strictly for money. Paul says never charge a penny. And get this, they thought less of Paul who didn't charge anything than these who came, these, quote, super apostles who were charging them money. Verse 12 says, And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. 
He is not surprising them if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So Paul is kind of like uh, maybe telling us how it really is. Um, I can't agree more. And so all I can say is, you know, don't church hop. Don't be listening to the to the modern message of the day. Find a church, one preaching the gospel, one that can be entertaining, but not centered on entertainment. At the end of the day, it really isn't about sounding pretty. It is the word of God. It's nourishment for us. So Paul talks about these ones masquerading as servants of righteousness and how they lived off the church. They lived comfortably. We know what the life of Paul was like. Remember, he tells us that he worked much harder, been in free, uh, prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times he received the, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was pelted with stones. Three times he was shipwrecked. He spent a night and day at the open sea. He'd been constantly on the move. He'd been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger of false, from false believers. He had labored and toiled and gone without sleep. He had known hunger and thirst and had gone without food. He had been cold. He had been naked. Besides everything else, he says, he faces daily the pressure of his concern for the churches. I can't even begin to imagine the life of Paul. He went through so much, and he did it for one reason. For he says in 1 Corinthians 9, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He was driven not by a career, not by money. He was driven by conviction. Lord, let us live by conviction. And let every part and let every act and every utterance from our mouth be through the Lord's leading and direction. Verse 30 says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. You know, I'd mentioned previously that I've been interviewing for superintendent positions and, and what we call interviewing, I hate to say, but in many ways is in reality boasting. You know, it's, it's like, oh, wow, look at the things that I have done. Oh, wow, look at the things that I can do. But, you know, that's kind of the society we live in, too. Um, society's kind of good at boasting, isn't it? I mean, look at Hollywood, look at Sports USA, look at Music Land, and of course, politicians. Now, they're the ones who really know how to boast. They love to talk about how great they are. So, you know, why are we so good at boasting? Well, maybe because we had a good teacher. Jesus? No, of course not. He is the example and the teacher of humility. Our teacher, of course, it talks about, already it talked about the devil, uh, masquerading as light. Um, instead of bringing worship to the angels, uh, uh, the, angel, the worship of the angels to the Lord, the boastful devil decided that he was worthy and took it upon himself. See, the devil thinks he is worthy. And every action he makes is a boast. He wants to prove how great and wonderful he is in mankind. He wants to prove what a waste of time it was for God to invest so much into us. His ultimate boast is our demise. The good news, as the old song says, we win, we win, hallelujah, we win. I read the back of the book and we win. Truth is, we don't have much to boast about. Romans twelve three for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. He says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Okay, let's do that. Sober judgment. Yeah, there is no good thing. In my heart, in my life, sober judgment tells me it's all God. Romans 7, 18, it says it this way, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, if anyone had the right, the privilege, and in, in, in the background to, to boast, it was Paul. He was an educator amongst all educators, and he was a leader amongst all leaders, but, but there was no boasting for Paul. He realized it was the Lord. His only boast, his only boast, was his weaknesses that God used for his glory. 
So let us remember all that is accomplished in our lives, definitely not the result of ourselves. It is God working through us. So if Paul is against boasting, why is he boasting? Well, if you listen, his boasting is dripping with sarcasm. He knows he has nothing to boast about, and he knows those boasting, quote, super apostles have nothing, nothing to boast about. They have no anointing, no message from God, no truth. All they had was their boast. Maybe this is a good thing for us to remember. If you turn on the television or your computer and all of the, quote, speakers of the word, all they do is boast, well, maybe they're just like those boasters in Corinth living off of the church. So for the sake of time, let me just share that the beginning of chapter 12, Paul does go on boasting. Again, realize very sarcastically boasting because he knows he doesn't need to boast. It's amazing, though, what he says. Verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in, to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And it says, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. What's kind of cute in is, is that um, that was Paul. Paul was talking about Paul, but again, he doesn't boast. And then he explains why. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We know these verses. We've heard messages and, and kind of sometimes even debates about their meaning. I'm one that simply kind of believes this. Don't overcomplicate things. Um, don't make verses more than they are or less than they are. Paul says it all. In order not to be conceited, God wanted his eyes on him. And so God does, allowed, God did allow a thorn, whether physical or spiritual. That to me doesn't matter. It could be either or. But the Lord himself said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As one who's kind of had his share of thorns over the last five years, all I can tell you is this, God's grace is sufficient. And his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. So let me close with this. You know, verse 11 says, I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not at in least inferior to these, quote, super apostles, even though I am nothing. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. How were you inferior to other churches except that I was never a burden to you. Forgive me this wrong. <laughs> so these super apostles, in quotes, came and they preached and asked for support from the church. Paul was never a burden. He came with signs, wonders, and miracles. So this might not be popular now, what I'm going to say, with, with those who love to watch these mega pastors and these mega churches. But please listen. I'll admit I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. Too many mega pastors are just like these, these, these super apostles. They come, they preach, and they want money. Paul is like the faithful pastor, always there, always faithful in ministry and word and never a burden. That's your local pastor. Now, I admit I have a bias. Do you know who has always been there for me? My pastors. Oh, it's true. When I want to be, quote, entertained, I turn on the quote super apostles but my Paul is my pastor after all it is our local pastor in in my case pastor John who's always there always faithful always ready with with a prayer or word but I can't go to church due to my age or illness or disability you know one of the neat things that the pandemic did Again, what the devil meant for evil, God used for good is, is, you know, almost all local pastors probably do have a word online. Um, again, me, as for me and my house, local church, local pastor, that's why we pray for our local pastors. And also remember, when we are weak, then we are strong. Let's pray. Lord, we do first and foremost pray for our pastors. 
but they are just, they're on the front lines. They are under attack. The enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, and nobody that the devil wants to destroy more is our local pastors. Lord, I just pray a double portion of your spirit around them. Protect them. Lord, keep them. Watch over them. Protect them. Protect their families. I pray for Pastor John. I pray for Amy. I pray for the kids. I pray for the churches. Lord, I pray special anointing and blessing, a double portion of your spirit. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us within the church, will we will realize that when we are weak, for we are weak, each and every one, we have our weaknesses. But when we are weak, we are strong. And we are strong not because of who we are. We are strong because of who you are in us. Lord, let us surrender this day, allowing you to be the strength in our hearts and in our lives that the word might go forth with anointing and with power. We pray for the services tomorrow, Lord. We just pray, bless, bless, bless the church. And in these difficult times, we pray more than all things for your anointing and your blessing. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being uh, with us tonight.